Good morning. I'm Mike Nelson. I'm a principal technology policy strategist here at Microsoft and have been for the last three months. Uh, I'm also very active in the DC chapter of the Internet Society and very glad to host this event uh, of the DC chapter where we're going to explore what happened uh, a few weeks ago in Bali at the Internet Governance Forum. Uh, I'm part of the technology policy group within Microsoft, and our team is responsible for coordinating our activities on internet governance. Uh, so we are well represented in Bali, uh, and have been very involved in Wicket and some of the other uh, international negotiations about the future of the internet. Uh, we're very closely with our legislative and lobbying team, and the U.S. Uh, government affairs team fills most of the offices on this floor. Uh, they tend to focus more on today's issues and today's fights. Uh, we tend to look to the future and try to figure out where we're going and how we can get there faster. Uh, very glad you're all here. Uh, this is an audience participation event. We have two people who are labeled on the program as discussion leaders, but that just means that I'm going to ask them questions first and then I'm going to ask you. Uh, so just a show of hands, how many people were in Bali? Okay. How many people have been at previous Internet Governance Forum meetings? And now the really interesting question, how many people couldn't go to Bali but stayed up all night watching the webcasts? <laughs> <laughs> you were the true heroes. So you, you are fully entitled to chime in on the discussion as well. Our goal today is just to talk a little bit about how we saw the meeting, what we got out of it, what we were worried about, what we were excited about, and most importantly, talk about where we're going next, because there will be another Internet Governance Forum meeting next year in Turkey. There's also going to be a Internet Governance Unconference Summit <laughs> high-level meeting, something like that, at the end of April or in early May in Brazil. Uh, that was a hot topic in Bali, and we'll talk about that a lot. So anyway, um, I, as I said, we'll, we'll make this audience participation be out a microphone that I'll be passing around and uh, just make sure to indicate who you are if you want to be known because we are webcasting this. We have a lot of you know, eager participants remotely, people who are uh, eager to find out what went on in Bali. So let me start by introducing our first discussion our first discussion question and that is a very simple one. Uh, what most surprised you about what happened in Bali? What was the most and striking thing to you that you weren't expecting. And to start the discussion, I'm going to hand it over to David Gross and Gene Kimmelman. Uh, David Gross, many of you know, uh, he used to be the uh, coordinator for international telecommunications policy at the State Department. Uh, he was our cyber ambassador, probably logged almost as many miles as uh, Hillary Clinton did over the last couple of years. Uh, and David is now very involved with companies like Microsoft and Verizon players in the internet governance space. So I'll turn to him and then we'll turn it over to Gene Kimmelman, who's been working with the New America Foundation and other groups. Um, David is a veteran of how many internet governance forms? All. All. <laughs> Anybody else who's been to all of the internet governance forms? You're the right discussion leader. Well, now Gene, on the other hand, was like me, attending for the first time. So we'll have two different viewpoints. And, uh, and as I say, then we'll turn it over to you. So your reflections, what was most surprising in Bali? Well, first of all, thank you very much, uh, Mike. And I'm pleased to see so many people came out for the free food. Uh, that's always a good sign on a Friday morning. Um, you know, I think uh, in terms of what was surprising, I think um, at the risk of offending people, uh, what I was probably most surprised about was how extraordinarily well organized uh, the meeting was. As I think probably everybody knows there was a question about whether or not the event would happen itself. Uh, there were funding issues. Uh, there was a sense of, from my perspective, of disorganization, uh, if not lack of organization. Uh, not so much by the MAG. MAG, as usual, had done an extraordinary job. But from a host government perspective, and those of us who have put on these shows before know how extraordinarily important the host government is to the success or failure of it types of uh, events. So I, I, uh, I was apprehensive, I guess, about this, um, because I also know how hard this type of 
uh, meeting is to, to pull off well. We've had some in the past that have been very, very well done, and others that have been uh, charitably less well or organized. Uh, and I thought this, you know, I know a lot of people thought this was the best organized. I certainly don't disagree with that. It was certainly amongst the very best organized. The venue was very good. It worked well for those who were at Baku the year before. Remember how frustrating a lot of the conversations were because of just technical issues. And again, not a post-government problem, but just the venue itself made a lot of the discussions and a lot of the, the parts of the meeting very difficult. And uh, uh, this venue was very, very good. I, I thought the host did a very good job of organizing the team to go very smoothly. The substance of it, I thought, was first rate and would have been first rate even without the more recent events that obviously were a great focus, uh, whether it's the NSA issues, whether it's Brazil uh, and the like, uh, which is that a lot of people recognize were a primary focus of uh, both uh, the presentations uh, but also the hallway conversation. So in terms of what I was most surprised about, I think it really was the high quality of the organization, the energy associated with that, the attendance. Uh, got, what, 1,500 people registered? Well, you know, uh, you know, it's interesting. There were a lot of discussions about the fact there was a lot of uh, comments that this was the most well attended, uh, I get. Uh, I'd be interested to see what the real figures turn out to be. My sense, and it's always very difficult because it's different venues, my sense is it was very well attended, but I'd be surprised it was the best attended. Uh, you know, usually the host governments fill these venues up with people from the neighborhood uh, in order to boost attendance. And uh, I didn't see as many of the people from the Pasar there as I might have otherwise seen uh, in other places. So, uh, but it was well attended. Jane? Yeah, well, I totally agree that there's uh, huge combination with the Indonesian government for pulling it together. I thought it was extremely uh, user-friendly public friendly, open, and, and very uh, efficiently done, notwithstanding the difficulties on the funding side. Sometimes Mike and I are the only two people at 2 o'clock in the morning in the virtual session. Um, Derek is from American from University. American University. Um, I think for me, one of the biggest surprises uh, was how robust the IGF infrastructure is. Uh, so the IGF infrastructure that still is a testament to IGF that you can have good hallway conversations when all the right people have been attracted from all over the world to come to the same hallways so that you can have those conversations. Um, so I think that uh, you know there, there are not as many conversations and people saying that there is no value to the IGF, that this is a complete waste of time and you know, it shouldn't be there. I think the fact that now that we've had eight uh, IGFs, you know, post, you know, post uh it has uh, really created a space where it's relatively unique. Um, it has uh, divergent uh, and diverse voices uh, coming to the table, uh, articulating different perspectives. Um, you know, you have a, an interesting institutional form that has emerged and has really solidified its place in these discussions. And so I think that was a real, um, you know, given all the transformations that it's gone through, um, the fact that it's still there and still attracts, you know, so many of the right people every year, I think is a real, uh, real plus. Perspective? Um, She's the first time. This is my first, yeah, exactly. This is my first time. And I was just um, a part of Derek's um, delegation. But I guess for me, just, this program, I think, when I first saw it, um, when we were preparing to go, I had never been to a conference that large. And I think um, this is just, there were so many simultaneous sessions and it kind of is a testament to just the rich um, conversations and all the you know myriad topics of um, discussion and all the pre-events that occurred as well. And so just this plethora of, of information to me was, um, uh, really gratifying and also a bit uh, overwhelming. So, <laughs> for me, one of the neat things was yeah. the use of Twitter, so you could follow mm -hmm. what was going on in all the rooms you weren't in. Mm -hmm. And when there started to be a real debate on Twitter, you knew it was time to leave your session and go to the other <laughs> session, unless you were on the panel. You know that was a problem. Norman? Oh, thank you very much. I first wanted to uh, 
recognize uh, David Gross, um, particularly in, in addition to being uh, at every single one, uh, he was very much a part of the, the, the group that um, gave birth, if you will, to, to the IGF as a way, as a, as a multi-stakeholder um, forum for discussing, you know, internet, internet uh, policy issues, and I think it's, it's and it's testament to, again, how quickly, uh, and, and also some just very great, well done, you know, uh, program there in, in that. A couple of things, though, that are uh, concerning, and again, not to, not to distract at all, but the, the, the lateness. We're on most surprise, uh, biggest surprise. Oh, the biggest surprise. I get, uh, I, little of the surprise, um, no surprise at all, actually, the Chinese reading us the right act on spy. That wasn't a big surprise. I was surprised, surprised there weren't more Chinese there. Uh, there uh, were very few Chinese. You know, that is interesting. Yeah, you had the one guy sort of leading the, the Can you tell that story? Not even the people who were in Bali didn't necessarily come to that session. Oh, my. Well, this it, was it, one it, of it, the highlights. It really was. And he, and, he, and he insisted on delivering it in Chinese, which I thought was actually a nice, smooth move. So everybody had to put on there. They probably had them off when he was taught. But in any event, you know, uh, uh, but. It was a little, uh, uh, I don't, you know, it was a big dressing there. down, right, it was a big dressing down, although, although, again, it was, it, you know, for those on the inside of the playpen, you know, it was a big smile on your face anyway, because it's just ridiculous soup of stuff that everybody trades back and forth, but in, it, in any event, that was really something, and it was in the main hall, and, you know, the, the open mic session, but, but and he came up twice. It wasn't once. He came. He came back to sort of smack it again. I think that he wasn't finished, you know. But uh, so he had a. But uh, it was. It was really. But getting back, one of the things, though, real quick, that that um, the lateness of this call did have a ripple effect in that there there was a list of countries, uh, U.S. being one of them, obviously, where you could go and get your your uh, visa actually in, in you know at the airport there. But there was a whole list of them where you had to have. A, a uh, uh, you know, you had to go to the consulate there, in in country, in your your native country, and you had, there was a you know a, a time, many of those had so there was a number of them. In fact, several from that I had lined up for my workshop in South Sudan, for example, that just weren't able to come because again they weren't they you know they weren't on that privileged list. So that had a unfortunate you know consequence um, on on this. So you just have to you know. Um, sure that's being looked at, but um, it was a good session, it really was. One of the nice things that they announced, one of the big surprises for me was that the final session where they announced the next three hosts for the next three internet governance forums, so Turkey, Brazil, Mexico, and so we have, have some momentum here, I guess. Anybody else who has comments on surprises, things that they heard, who didn't expect? Sure. Um, Andrew Mankin, Global. Uh, two surprises, I think. Um, the first one was in, the, in all, all the things around the whole NSA issue. Uh, thought it could have gone very differently. Number of, was surprised by the number of conversations that I had with people, including people from the Global South, who said that the world is basically divided up into two, two, two categories. Those that are obviously doing the same stuff and only wish they were better at it. <laughs> and those that aren't doing it but are trying very, very hard to develop that capacity. So that I think that there was a, a fair amount of sobriety around the idea that, that no one was shot, shot, like in Casablanca. Um, so that was one thing, and I think that that actually lowered the temperature a little bit, uh, at least rhetorically. And the second one was, um, as a Portuguese speaker, to listen to what the, to, to your point, uh, what the Brazilians said publicly and what the Brazilians said um, between themselves uh, in Portuguese is slightly different. The tone very, very different. And uh, I think that there is still a little bit of kind of city to the man that we've got to be mindful of because uh, everybody plays nice in public. But, um, you know, I, I, I just think, I think it's, it's, it's something to bear in mind that there is this sense that it's now our turn and, we, 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 you know, the clock is changing. Other people who have comments about surprises? Okay. Tim? Thank you, Michael. Uh, I'm Tim McGinnis. Um, I did stay up all night uh, watching webcasts. Uh, the one meeting I didn't get to sit in on was the Civil Society Internet Governance Caucus List meeting, face-to-face <laughs> -face meeting, and apparently it nearly came to blows. <laughs> there was shouting and uh, nearly, 
let the several people, senior civil society folks you know from meetings in Geneva, actually had to walk out if they felt intimidated and threatened. So that was quite a surprise. But the rest of it went uh, pretty much according to how I thought it would go. Wait, was anybody, did anybody catch this meeting? Oh, yeah. it's all about who is more civil society than the other. Right, yeah. Who's, who, who belongs who's in the room and who is that? Yeah. Who, who represents the public interest? Yeah. Are there, are there comments? Were, were you there, Derek? Yeah. And do you want to, do you want to no, share? No, I don't. You don't want to <laughs> I'll just say it was uncomfortable, and McTim's uh, description of it was accurate. And it wasn't webcast. It, it was not webcast. <laughs> All of the meetings well, are never webcast. Let me just explain. I was in the meeting. Maya came to bring me something. And again, she's a new person. And she walked in the room, and she was she could feel how uncomfortable it was. She gave me what she was bringing me, and turned around and walked out. <laughs> uh, and it got worse. Uh, so whatever it was, it was definitely uncivil. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Please introduce yourself. Sure. Uh, Jim Prendergast with Galway Strategy Group. Um, one surprise and a little disappointing was the open microphone sessions on Friday afternoon. I thought they would be a little better, a little more interactive, but I think we uh, lost a lot of participation to depart departing flights and uh, fantastic beach weather on a Friday afternoon. So, kind of disappointed and surprised that they didn't go over as well as it should have. My biggest disappointment was I had a grand total of two hours to walk on the beach <laughs> between 6.30 and 7.30 in the morning. Yeah, I did, I did not plan right. Okay, so the next question is, more positive here after talking about the Discord. What was the most exciting thing? What was the thing that we really came away jazzed about? You know, the thing that we hope we can build on. So I'll turn it again to our, our veteran. Well, I think uh, probably what I was most uh, jazzed about, to, to use your phrase, um, was the sense that it was not the end, but rather there, it, probably some increased momentum. Again, going back. Uh, just a couple of months, I think there was a real question about the sustainability, not just financially, but also whether or not the IGF had sort of run its course. Uh, and uh, my sense coming out of it was that I was struck by how the conversations have so radically changed from the early days, not to sound too old here, but, but there was a confrontational style, uh, putting the civil society piece to one side, uh, but you know, the early days of IGF, it was, it, was, it was sort of a continuation of WISIS in the sense that it was very confrontational. It was often very uncomfortable, uh, particularly for private sector people and so forth. Um, it has evolved. Uh, it continues to evolve pretty substantially. I thought the energy, the enthusiasm, the forward thinkingness, and frankly, a lot of the sense that people are trying to find ways together to move forward. There's a very, I, I continue to find it a very constructive dialogue, not a, not a, as I said, as the early days, confrontational. So I think my, what I'm excited about is that I think there's a sense that there really continues to be an important place for the IGF, that it's not uh, being dismissed by some governments as purely a talk shop without substance, uh, that I think civil society, the private sector, and governments, although the governments were as often the case actually was less, I think, representative. Other than the US and Brazil, most government representation was pretty low in this one, I think, for a variety of reasons, uh, particularly coming out of Europe. Uh, but I think, uh, go looking ahead, I think there is uh, obviously always room for improvement, always opportunities for change. Uh, but I've been impressed by how the IGF itself has been changing, both substantively and, and organizationally. Gene? <coughs> I do too. You can do two. two you can be excited about more than one thing. Excited about more than one thing. Um, so in the, the, the pre-event, the um, high-level meeting, and then really going into the Building Bridges main session, um, what I think, what I was asked about, and I don't know if this is a continuation, but I was certainly impressed, the, um, the, the people selected to represent civil society were Global South women. <clears throat> and I think that's just an important statement. I don't know if that really is a continuation or whatever it is, if it's something that should continue, uh, because I think it, it's sort of an indication of some of where the strength is in civil society now. Um, the other thing that really jazzed me was, um, was not the IGF. It was the best business meeting the two days before it, which um, most of you may not be at all familiar with, but I want to describe it quickly just so you know, because 
the bedlam about the civil society discussion and who it represents was um, in some ways set up by the fact that a group of, of, uh, of NGOs got together in Baku last year as uh, in preparation for the wicket and we wanted to talk about an action agenda not just about all the broad issues. And uh, it was bedlam for a while, but over two days actually came up with a statement that went to the wicked. And that group kind of has grown over the last year of self-selected groups that want to participate actively in the internet governance conversation. How many are there um, now? So at this meeting, there were more than 70. So it went from about company, 30, seven, 70, 70 organizations. organizations yeah. uh, and then a number of academics, a number of experts. Um, but it was more than 70 in the room. And um, a lot of conversation, but the most interesting thing was in discussing what this was going to be going forward, it was agreed this would be an open platform for civil society, for mostly NGOs, to opt in if they want to participate and push certain agenda items. So it's, it's gone from what I think in the Internet uh, Governance Caucus and, and discussions around it from pure conversation and pure consensus to something where people are coming in with an idea of I want to push a certain set of ideas forward, norms, suggestions for how to respond to questions of, of regulation around the internet. And there's a broad group of NGOs who want to participate in that. So I find that to be an exciting development. Um, where we go, I don't know, but the focus was really on Brazil towards the end, was the next uh, locus of, of activity. I'm really glad you raised that because for me the most exciting thing was to see the civil society groups turn to concrete actions. Mm -hmm. uh, I've tuned into a lot of the previous sessions, I've seen a lot of the statements that were published there, and a lot of those sessions it was all about highlighting the abuses of the host government, which in some cases were pretty serious, mm -hmm. but it wasn't about doing something going forward. It was, it was making news, maybe putting a book out, putting some banners up, but it wasn't going to change the game in other countries around the world. And what I saw this time was a real effort to sit down and say, OK, let's use technology to foster human rights. And I was on a panel about that topic. And it, it, was, it was so different from the old conversation because they, they knew the technologies that could help. They were looking for resources to get them deployed. They were also looking to develop a, a sort of a charter. Microsoft has a global human rights statement that we discussed in one of the panels that was held up as a model that other kind of companies could, could endorse, or they write their own and endorse that. And the human rights groups saw the value of that, getting major players to say, we stand for these things. And then when you do that, you're accountable. That's concrete. So that, that was exciting. And I think that's, that, that could have repercussions down the line. Other, other excitement? Um, when you say can, I, can I give you a, give you a uh, yeah, mic? Introduce yourself. Yeah, uh, Patrice Lyons. I think of the one in Bali. I'm sorry, I didn't. You know, How many did you answer? Oh, quite a few. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so in any event, uh, David, you mentioned about uh, it's not just a talk shop, and initially it was set up uh, to be a gathering place, sort of like a convention. I and mean, there's lots and lots of conventions on uh, lawyers, so you know, you've got a lot of meetings and stuff, and you talk about things, and you can adopt positions, uh, whatever. But it, it doesn't really turn it into something that's actionable. It's not going to be actionable in any practical way insofar as legal structures are concerned. So am I hearing between Jean and David a little difference of opinion here? And Mike, at your last comment, when you said uh, the NGOs having sort of actions they're going to take, um, this would turn IGF kind of inside out a bit. If, if it's really taken to the extent where there's an independent source of regulatory type action. Just to be clear, I, I wasn't saying that the IGF was going to take action. I was saying that the different groups were coming together and saying, here's something we can do independent of IGF. They didn't need to get the whole conference to agree. So my example was, can the human rights groups work with companies get them to endorse a human rights agenda. So that's self-regulation. And then there's other cases where people were thinking, let's go home with a good idea and get our national government to do something, rather than turning to the UN or some intergovernmental body to do something. So that, that's what I was referring to. I, I, I'll let uh, David and Jean go on. Yeah, I think that's a good point. Um, I think that 
Yeah, and that, that's good because um, it's, it's something, I, and I noticed also from a technical perspective, that oftentimes they wanted to do principles. And what it often was, was locking in yesterday's technology. We're always trying to lock in end to end as if that was a principle. No, it's not. But in any event, uh, with the human rights, you have a lot of groups that work in that area. And if the IGF then somehow votes themselves as being a source of some sort of recommendations that would then be taken back and given weight at the national level, all right, so then you're moving in a direction that's changing the nature of IGF. And that's, that was really my question. I, I, I'm, I can say I didn't hear that. I, I was hearing individual actions. Do you want to talk a little bit about the difference between IGF action and independent actions? Uh, sure. Uh, uh, Patricia, I, I think from where I, what I saw, what I heard, uh, should not raise any concerns. And it is an area that I watched very carefully when we established uh, the IGF at, at WISIS. Uh, uh, my fifth grade uh, English teacher would probably have been very upset because when the proposal was negotiated, when I negotiated, uh, our team negotiated it with, uh, with the other governments, uh, I inserted uh, basically a double negative to ensure that nothing would come out that would be uh, viewed as uh, as a decision making or actionable types of things coming out of the IGF itself. Having said that, obviously you're bringing together a lot of people with a lot of interest and a lot of focus and I think all of us would hope that good things come from that and good things include ideas and proposals and opportunities for further work. Uh, so I think those two things are not at all in conflict uh, and uh, there were no calls, at least that I heard, uh, to establish some declaration to do something in the name of the IGF for the people who are there. Yeah, so, so I think <clears throat> it's a bit more diverse than that on the civil society side, or the uncivil <laughs> part. Um, there, I think there are a variety of viewpoints. I mean, there, there, are, there were some presented in the discussion that it is just a place to come talk, and why do it, and is it worth anything? And so one suggestion is that it's a place to come, but others really were looking for ways to strengthen the IGF and actually lead it towards a, pro a, a process where it could make recommendations. Um, and so there was a civil society discussion in this test this meeting about what that might look like and what those ideas would be. Before you jump to any conclusions about it, what I think was interesting about it is not just the idea gets floated and or someone says this is what should happen. There was a lot of discussion about what would the mechanism look like? How would you select the people? What would the process be? How could you have fair representation? So it was all churned around, but there were points of view to somehow strengthen IGF over time to have more gravitas, not just be a discussion, but have more gravitas. Others were looking more towards Marcos Seville in Brazil. Is that going to be a model of something? Are the Argentinians doing a net neutrality law? Chile has one. There was a lot of discussion about models and benchmarks and what one might use. Uh, again, I think very interestingly, from the civil society side, something I think, different than what one would have expected a few years ago, very much driven by Global South. This wasn't what are the Europeans doing or what's the US doing, although that's obviously part of the discussion relevant, but other countries are doing things that interested everyone across that NGO um, um, uh, kind of set of viewpoints. So I think there were a lot of different things that were presented on the civil society side that um, could ultimately be suggestions to IGF, suggestions that will come out of the Brazilian summit. Um, and, um, but you know, I, it was a very thoughtful discussion process, not just love, love something out there. It was, if you, if you were going down this path, what would it look like? And is it workable? Let me just add uh, that if you're looking for where this issue is likely to be addressed in a substantive way rather than sort of a in a grassroots way, it's likely to be in the WISIS plus 10 uh, process. And uh, what will come out, uh, as everyone knows, the UN is in the process, as it always does, 10 years out from the end of, uh, of the summit, uh, to look at what uh, should happen, if anything, whether there should be another uh, conference summit or whether or not there should be just recommendations. And that's being worked out at the UN as we speak, and that will be a process over the next year. And I would be shocked if 
the, if there isn't a robust discussion about what uh, what the IGF should do in terms of proposals, declarations, uh, and that continuing uh, tension. Okay, anybody out here who had uh, something that got them excited? Any particular sessions they thought were really good? Um, I just, on this last point, I think that it's important to recognize that the best bids meeting, uh, as exciting as it was, was a pre-meeting. So it wasn't a part of the IGF <laughs> itself. And I think there are these interesting add-ons that can take place that don't affect this unique structure of the IGF. And I think David is absolutely right. I think it would change the character and will change the character that moves in that direction of the IGF actually taking declarations and policy statements. It, it, it would change the character of what I think is so valuable uh, about the IGF. Um, so in, in the same vein of these pre-conference activities, I continue to be excited about GigaNet. Um, I was one of the founders of uh, the Global Internet Governance Academic Network. Um, it uh, started meeting back in, uh, I guess it was Greece, um, on the day before uh, IGF. Uh, it's a gathering of scholars from a very interdisciplinary perspective who study internet governance. So you've got computer scientists and engineers, information scientists, political scientists, international relations scholars, a range of people that study uh, internet governance coming together. Um, it's a, a peer-reviewed academic uh, conference uh, seen as very valuable to scholars who study internet governance. And uh, we had standing room only uh, uh, participation at this year's uh, GigaNet. Uh, it, was, it was fantastic. People you know, literally were standing up, no chairs, uh, and it was that, that full. Um, another interesting aspect of the way GigaNet uh, happened this year was the afternoon sessions were designed to break down barriers between academics and practitioners. And so there were a series of panels in the afternoon where academics were on panels with practitioners, whether they be government or uh, private sector or civil society, talking about some of the challenging issues around surveillance and so forth. So I, I was extremely pleased once again with, um, with GigaNet and, and uh, the way that that organization contributes to IGF. I to second that. I was able to attend about half of it. Unfortunately, I had a conflict in the afternoon, but uh, a lot of very interesting papers and people to back and forth. And the papers are all available. So, uh, particularly one of your colleagues, uh, Laura Denardis, did a very nice paper on the different flavors of internet governance and multi-stakeholderism. What is it? What do people mean in different contexts when they say we're a multi-stakeholder process? Right. And her conclusion was some of the definitions lead to unfortunate outcomes. Where people are saying they're multi-stakeholder, and it really isn't listening to everybody's voice. Right. It's more of a we make the decisions, and we'll listen to you. We have a multi-stakeholder advisory panel, which we ignore. Big thing. So, very interesting, uh, thoughtful paper. Are there things that people were surprised about, excited about, jazzed about? I, I think in terms of the kind of culture of the meeting, the feeling of the meeting, I'm going to pick up some of the things that are there. Um, I remember being in Athens and having the Cubans get up and make a very un -y kind of statement about you know the future of the internet and the way we're going to have it work in our country. And then the Iranians get up and make a similar kind of statement. And so uh, this seemed very, very different. I think that the whole multi-stakeholder, the, almost the ICANN culture seems to be really have permeated through this meeting. I don't know if that's a permanent fight feature of the, uh, feature of the future of IGF, but it seemed to be very collaborative, and that was really nice. Um, the other one is, is that, as compared to some of the earlier IGFs, I found not all of them, but many of the uh, many of the, the, the sessions more based on best practice. I felt like I learned more. It was less of a here's my position. I'm going to plant my flag, you know, and and, and, and yell about it, and much more about the, the much more again much more collaborative. Our session had about 70 people in it. I was the only person from North America that was in the room. Which it was, session? Was it was it was all about uh, economic development and and, and the internet. I'll find another other thing. I remember the exact term, but it was a terrific session. Uh, the panelists evenly divided between men and women, and uh, really a lot of audience participation. And I found that that was that was something that hadn't happened in a lot of the earlier ones. It's a lot less formal and a lot more interactive that way. We had an amazing session that Wolfgang Kleinbacher organized on the Internet of Things, and just free flowing, 
with really great ideas. And there were four different debates going on at the same time. So different people were weighing in on these different issues. And one of the big debates was whether the Internet of Things was something that a government's forum should even get into. Because so much of it is you know, beyond the Internet. But a lot of discussion about how do you deal with this new thing? Do we need a new separate set of regulations? Do self-regulatory mechanisms just for the Internet of Things, or is it just part of what we've got? Really good discussion back and forth. Something else you were jazzed about? Uh, yeah, and it's uh, Jim Pryor guessing, and it's a little self-serving, but uh, I was the moderator for a, a youth session on digital citizenship that was coordinated with some of your colleagues from Redmond. And the, the interactive nature of it and the youth participation in the IGF continues to get me very excited. Uh, last year in Baku, a similar session ran 90 minutes. We had something like 31 different people take to the microphone. This year we were relegated, I guess, to a flash session, which was only for 45 minutes, and we still had close to 30 people sharing, interacting, and uh, sharing experiences. And it was amazing to see the youth really step up and, and drive the agenda and drive the, the, the discussion during that. And, um, they're very smart. They're very sharp. They, you know, afterwards in the hallway, they came out and they said, Yesterday was nothing but five people sitting at a table speaking at us, and it was awful. I said, this was great. And I think that's something that the IGF and the MAG and the, and the Secretariat need to take into account is, you know, we started this year with some of the flash sessions being alternative formats to your typical, you know, panel speaking at the audience. The more interactive we can make this, the more you can learn from different participants, I think it's more valuable for everybody involved. Well, you definitely get down to the debates. That, that's that was the key to the best sessions I was in. Patricia? Okay, um, Mike, I'm picking up on something you said again. Because uh, I was in the IoT session, the Internet of Things, last year, well, the year before last, and I've kept up with Wolfgang. And we've had differences from a technical perspective because mostly the Internet of Things is the Internet. But it's just taking it to a more um, uh, advanced, evolved level of addressing that goes beyond, say, the DNS. You know, you know, it goes to actually addressing the actual information rather than ports and machines. My point being that if as you, somebody decides that it's not supposed to be in the IGF for discussion, because somebody has decided that it's not what the internet is, my problem over the years is that oftentimes they're trying to narrow what the internet is, where everything else is evolving quite rapidly and they should be open to those new types of developments. So I would be very concerned if there was sort of understandings or recommendations or principles that were emerging from the IGF that would limit the future of the internet, having been involved in it now for many, many years. Well, as I said, there were about four different debates going on. One of them was, do we need to look at the file of things? So this was this question of whether we need to consider both the devices, the network, and where all the data goes, which is into the cloud. And the, and the argument then was, OK, this is the Internet Governance Forum. It's not the Cloud Governance Forum. So maybe we do have to put some limits on what we're going to talk about in, in Turkey. So that was one of the arguments. The other big argument was whether there was a need for a different kind of, of, uh, of identifier system and whether there was need to go beyond IPv6, develop something else. So there, that was another technical argument that we were going on. Yeah. See, that's the thing about the uh, IGF. There's not sufficient representation from the technical community. Because long ago, years ago, cloud was the internet. And it's still the internet. And you're talking about uh, cloud computing. It's just distributed storage and management of information in an internet environment. And most of the technical people over the years say, well, yeah, it's just the internet. So the fact that you would have a group who are not technical people saying, well, this should be outside the discussion, I find very troubling. Well, this, this, was the, this was the fourth thing we were debating, which was the language we should use. Because you're right, in the old days, a lot of the internet engineers referred to the internet as a cloud. And now we have a computing cloud, which consists of a whole bunch of data centers, which is separate and distinct from the network itself. But anyway, this, 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 we're not going to rehash this argument, but it's worth listening to. The, 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 whole, the whole discussion is online. You can listen to these, these, uh, these, these, these debates. 
Uh, but you brought up a really important point, which uh, uh, I wanted to get into what disturbed us, what was worrisome. And your last point about there not being a lot of technical people at the IGF, and I think fewer than in the past years, is, is something we should be worried about. Because the, the great thing about the IGF is it does bring together the different communities. The techies, the lawyers, the policy makers, the uh, entrepreneurs, the, the youth. Um, but they're, they're, for whatever reason, probably because there were so many other technical meetings scheduled in the same few months, and because it was so far to go, we, we, we didn't have some of the, the IETF community. Uh, the, the Internet Society was there, but often it wasn't the technical people. So anyway, that's, that was my, my, my most worrisome observation. I'd, I'd be curious, our two lead speakers, what, what, what worried you? Did you come away with anything that kind of uh, made you uneasy? I'll start with Eugene. <clears throat> um, well, I think it's worrisome from, from what I saw in Bali, but it's even broader than that. I think, I think there's a trajectory towards um, um, a significant majority of countries thinking there needs to be greater oversight of the internet. And I think part of the debate is around the ITU, and it's very interesting, it kind of did get pushed back in the context of the discussion of the Brazil summit. But think about it, it got pushed back because it was supplanted by some other sense of that there will be a forum for trying to address these issues that are outside of the, the realm of the nation state. And, um, and I think, uh, so I think it's, there's, a, there's a troublesome path that, that is not troublesome in and of itself. It's troublesome that I think a lot of our conversation here is about how to divert this or how to um, uh, tap it down. Reshape it. Yeah. And I, think, and I think there needs to be a lot more creative thinking about how, how to really guide it in a, in a thoughtful way because I don't think it's going away. And so I think that's, that's what I think we need to spend more time thinking about. It was definitely there in a different form. It wasn't about the ITU, but it was about the same general interest from lots of stakeholders, particularly the countries themselves. Yeah, I, 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 I think building on what, what Gene said, uh, it, it's one of these glass half full, glass half empty issues. Uh, on the one hand, and actually probably not so much half, it's, is overflowing uh, this glass because my takeaway is uh, I thought that uh, next year was going to be quite robust and busy. Uh, it is clear that I underestimated how robust and how busy next year is going to be. Many billable hours. Uh, well, thank God for some things, I guess. Um, but you know, to, to be serious, it is the reason I'm sort of I, I don't see this necessarily as a, from a pessimistic perspective. It really underscores something which we all. I think are implicitly recognizing, which is uh, this conversation a few years ago uh, was really of interest to only a relatively small group of countries and a relatively small group of people within those countries. Uh, the conversation has shifted and sort of the, the, the flip side of what Gene's saying, which Gene recognizes as well, is that the great news is this stuff is important basically to everybody now. Uh, and when WISIS was being debated, the dialogue quickly devolved into a classic UN rights uh, type of discussion, in part because nobody really cared about any of the other stuff. But what we're finding is that now almost everybody does care not only about the right stuff, but also this other stuff too, and it's very important. So that's, I think, a very positive aspect. On the other hand, it will be a very full year. And, and to be serious about it, it's going to be very complicated to figure out whether you're in government, industry, civil society, how to cover all of the moving parts. That is going to be a great challenge because there are going to be a lot of places with a lot of important discussions and a lot of important work to be done. And that's going to be a challenge for everybody. Do you just want to recap the four or five that you're paying the most attention to for those people who are not IGF groupies? Uh, sure. And, and actually, the IGF is probably the one place you don't have to worry as much about yeah. uh, for the reasons that we were discussing, at least as of the moment. Um, but we have uh, at the ITU, uh, we have a World Health Communications Development Conference, uh, which although by definition is supposed to focus on development rather than some of these issues, clearly these issues, because of their relevance to development, will be uh, front and center. In addition, uh, for those of you who are ITU-focused uh, people, 
Uh, WTDC is almost always a dress rehearsal for the Plenty Pot, which is the end of Octo mid-October through early November, which will be very important at the ITU, both because these issues will be, by definition, front and center. Uh, the, I, this is the every four-year meeting where the ITU's convention and uh, constitution are redone. In addition, we'll have elections, so the leadership of the ITU and what their vision for that or UN organization will be, will be front and center. In addition, we'll have uh, a series of WISIS plus 10 events, including one uh, hosted by the ITU immediately after uh, uh, what used to be referred to as the Sharm el Sheikh event, but uh, uh, now uh, presumably we're going elsewhere, but also ITU. Um, we have, of course, Brazil, uh, yet to be determined what the scale, scope, and nature of that conference or name. will be. Uh, will be, but uh, nevertheless will undoubtedly be an important part of the discussion. Um, and then we have uh, a variety of things going on at the UN itself, uh, uh, both currently uh, going on, uh, but also next year, uh, both at the UN, at the CSTD, at the Senate Committee uh, level, uh, at UNGA, as we saw this year, we can expect next year. UN UNGA, General Assembly. UN General Assembly, for those who, that's where the people, the, the heads of state give the big speeches and so forth, uh, as it was this year. I mean, just to underscore what we're, I mentioned before, you know, a decade ago, it would have been unusual, absent perhaps Vice President Gore giving a speech at the ITU, to have the level of political involvement, heads of state political involvement on these very issues, the way we are starting to see it. We saw it this year, we see it a little bit before that, but I anticipate seeing more of that next year. On your earlier point, I was very glad this year not to hear people stand up and say, well, the internet is now a mature infrastructure, and since it's a mature infrastructure, we must regulate it like other mature infrastructures. The fact that there were so many sessions on the next version and the new emerging technologies was part of the reason we didn't hear the word mature very often. But we did hear the internet is now so important to our country that we need to regulate it. And that's that I heard over and over and over again. And that was uh, that was disturbing. On the other hand we had some sessions on self regulation and user control and all the right words, uh, from my opinion. Okay. Other things that were uh, disturbing, worrisome? So just uh, related to that um, uh, daunting schedule for next year that, that David just went through, one of the things that concerns me is, um, for me, it is important that civil society is involved in these processes and can, can engage effectively in these processes. So going back to the point that Tim raised is what's happening with civil society. That, that conflict that occurred uh, in Bali is not good for civil society. It's not good for these processes if, if that kind of organized you know, broad-based civil society can't, you know, get its act together to participate appropriately. There are some shining lights. Um, you know, the Best Fits group is clearly, you know, an organized civil society group that it seems to be functioning uh, fairly well. And there are lots of civil society people who are participating who don't necessarily participate within that organized civil society structure. But I think that that is a, is a concern, is that how does civil society engage effectively uh, in these processes? One other disturbing thing for me happened before the meeting, which was this sort of last minute uh, crisis of it's not going to happen, it is going to happen. You know, that sort of is not good for the, the sustainability of a process like this. So um, whatever reasons, I don't know all the details of what, what led to that, but I think we have to make sure that there's no, you know, pulling the plug at the last minute and then putting it back in. You know, we, we've got to make sure that, that, that these structures are sustainable in whatever way they need to be. Are there things to worry about? Okay. Yeah. Just, um, just a quick um, observation. Uh, uh, along the lines of being able to sort of um, multitask or walk and chew gum at the same time type of thing, which is to say, um, understanding the burning platform that was very much a part of the Bali this year with, with the Stoke revelations, and I say this behind and all that, along with the natural um, uh, maturing of the conversation regarding all the, the, the policy issues that came in prior to the, the overlay of the, of the spying issue. But what disturbed 
concerned me a little bit. And again, I, I wasn't at every session. Obviously, I had my own. That, that, again, the best of did a great job. So I always overpacked the participants. <laughs> anyway, of, of moving that process forward. But keeping focus on the fact that there are still billions and billions yet to be part of this debate, part of being spied on, part of having their data uh, you know, uh, uh, mined or whatever, because they have no access. They have, at best, 2G, maybe not even that. In other words, so the fact that we're, the, the concern here is that the mature process is not, is not yet reaching out to people and, and helping them come in to be a part of making these decisions. It's going to be making these decisions first, and then we'll, we'll bring these people on, and the decisions will already be made regarding all these issues. And, you know, well, I'm sorry you couldn't be a part of this, but, you know. So Take it or how, leave it. How, right. I mean, why don't, you know, we can do both, and we should continue to do the best we can to bring broadband to those who need it most. So connectivity. I, I just, I remember a lot more discussions about that in past you know, connecting the next billion as titles and focus and all that. And I just want to make sure that that continues to get the kind of focus that I think it deserves because. So, uh, what about the people? Do you have a comment from the government side here? You want to be anonymous? Well, new bar large with the State Department. I think um, it's worth noting that from our perspective, we really benefited from having very strong participation of a variety of stakeholders at the recent IGF, both with civil society, um, your government had at least three federal agencies uh, represented at the IGF, with Office of the State Department from Democracy, Human Rights, and Labor, my office, which is Communications and Information Policy, as well as um, an office that specializes on cybersecurity and cyber issues. And I think that um, a lesson of, of this going forward is to try to encourage strong participation of the private sector, of civil society, in future multilateral forums that we're seeing on the horizon and that were laid out by David in very clear terms. Um, one opportunity uh, to join the U.S. delegation would be the World Telecom Development Conference. Um, I think clearly, as we have in the past, we greatly benefit from the expertise, the knowledge, and the participation by all stakeholders on our delegation as we form positions and we think through strategically some of these challenging issues. So I would really encourage you to reach out directly to us, uh, let us know if you are interested, and try to be as actively engaged as you can. The other uh, just point to make is, uh, of course, you know, the IGF USA um, uh, may still uh, need to happen uh, in the next few months, uh, next year. Um, and that might be another avenue for us all to come together again and have these discussions here in Washington. Thank you very much for mentioning the IGF USA. Marilyn Kaye has organized that in the past, and the DC chapter of the Internet Society is talking to her about how we might be able to support her effort to do the meeting here. And it'll follow just between the IGF and the Brazil meeting, so it will be useful both to look back and to look forward. Um, I've had some great discussions in past IGF USA meetings. I've been to all of those. Uh, this was the first year I'd actually gone to the IGF. Thank you for your comments on that. Okay, so for those of you who did not go to Bali, you know, what, why are you here? What, what, what are you interested in? What are you concerned about? How can we help you understand more of this strange process that uh, happens every year? Yeah, that's right. It is a Questions from the, uh, from the audience? Or other comments from people who are worried? Yeah. Lee Marie, you want to introduce yourself? Hi, my name is Lee Marie. I'm a member of the ISOC DC chapter. and. Um, there's been a little bit of, you know, not a little bit, but quite a bit of press with the Snowden, quite a few articles about Brazil um, potentially having some government's um, challenges with how NASA and that whole issue. So what was the feeling, what was the mood for those of us that, you know, didn't have the privilege of attending when it comes to, um, I heard the Global South or uh, developing nations when it came to what they're looking for from the IGF to address those types of issues? That is a great question. It's actually not one of the questions I was going to ask was how, how do we as a community respond to these concerns? Because we're going to spend a lot of time at future meetings talking about these issues and we have to have a more positive response than, well, you know, everybody does it or everybody wishes they could do it. So any thoughts on that? Any, any uh, approaches to the Snowden question? 
Steepest to you, David? <laughs> uh, Gene is going to work. That's what you meant to say. <laughs> we'll let David clean up. <laughs> um, I think the earlier comment that it was a fairly mature response, that it's, it didn't, uh, among this group that is quite knowledgeable about what can be done with information flows, it was not surprising. I think that. Um, I think there was a, there, I think there were a lot of people watching to see what the U.S. government did and said, and I, and I think that the U.S. government taking a very level-headed, low-key approach was extremely wise. Um, I think to have been brash in that setting would have been a real mistake. Um, I think it was recognized by other governments that they needed to also speak openly, and honestly, because they don't they don't know what the next revolution might be, <laughs> whether it's in Snowden or somewhere else. So it was a bit of a um, inoculate yourself. Um, so I don't. I don't really think it ended up being as dominant as some might have thought. Mostly by the mature way it was generally handled, handled across the board. It probably though reinforced the sentiment that I think David was reflecting before, which is that more and more, and you, you seem like the government's view, of the internet is extremely important, and they want a say, and a lot of stakeholders think. It's very important. And the voters and back home say. care as well. And so it's part of this ongoing drumbeat. I don't think it dramatically shifted the conversation. Yeah, the only thing I might add is I, I, I don't know who came up with the idea, uh, but it was, I thought, a very wise idea to devote the last, in essence, was the last session uh, to be focusing on, as people often refer to it as the elephant in the room. Uh, and I think that had a very positive impact, both by allowing and recognizing there would be a time and a place for that discussion rather than that, but also it allowed for people not to focus all their attention on that during the course of the week. And I think that actually ended up, I don't know, probably overstates to say satisfied everybody that that would be wrong, but at least I think it was a good balance, it turned out to be a good balance. So, Although it was obviously discussed a lot during the many of the sessions, I don't think it necessarily dominated a lot of the sessions. I agree with you. If they hadn't done that, everybody would have been trying to torque right. other panels right. to address the issue. Right. And, and it was. It was a very lively discussion. Uh, I think the Chinese speaker was the most interesting. So another highlight you might want to watch is if you want to see a fascinating comment from the, the Chinese delegate. Okay. Um, uh, Bowdoin Contour, a Library of Congress. Um, I noticed one of the sessions was supporting local content development. And just given a context of uh, Wikipedia, there's more content about Antarctica, where there's very few people living, at, uh, compared to Africa, where there's a lot of people in a lot of languages. Did, did anyone attend? I attended that one. It was interesting because they were saying how it's um, it's helpful both from a macro and a micro perspective. So the locals are utilizing it to inform each other on a very basic level, let's say like our Yelp. Um, and then internationally, you're seeing more people want to talk about their culture and make it available to people um, you know, on a global level, as well as even from a tourism perspective of information that's now available that before would only be, you had to be a very large entity to have that information out there. And then they also talked about um, you know, uh, languages and, and certain arts that were just really not known outside certain cultures that have, have been more uh, digitally developed and talked about in that space. So there was there was kind of a, a big, a, you know, how the how it gets out to the world and how it actually also helps kind of embed in local society as well as certain things that would be getting lost because it wasn't digitized. Going back to like kind of paper elements. We have someone who covered that because th this is one of the reasons we're doing this session is because the IGF is like the elephants and the blind men, and the blind women. <laughs> Everybody's grabbing a different part of it, just grabbing yeah, different things. <laughs> yeah, Taylor, right. Uh, you mentioned there weren't many governments present. Is that a rejection of the multi stakeholder approach? Or what, what accounts for their absence? I can speculate. Uh, I don't know if you, if you have some thoughts on that. Part of it was that about a month and a half before. The meeting was supposed to convene, the Indonesians started saying, well, maybe we can't do it. And for some countries, particularly countries that don't have a large budget, and, you know, they, they hear that and they think, okay, well, we're going to go to a different meeting. Um, other, do you have a speculation on that? Or did you talk to some of the other governments there? 
I think it was very positive to see um, ministers from a lot of our key engagement uh, countries there, so Japan, Brazil, uh, for example. Um, the high-level session was relatively well attended and also reflected uh, multi-stakeholder um, character. Um, so that was also another positive development. Um, it's hard to know for sure kind of what uh, was that was attributed to. And there was this high-level meeting ahead of time where a number of government ministers flew in but did not stay for the main, main event. But uh, it did seem to me that there were fewer government people. And I think it's part of this agenda that, that David was talking about. They looked at their calendar and said, okay, there's six, five or six big meetings coming up. We can only go to three or four. Bali is a very long way away. I think the European parliamentarians weren't quite as well represented this year. I, they were about a dozen of them in the past. There were always 20 or 30. Yeah. Uh, maybe it'd be helpful. Uh, my sense is that uh, at the very beginning, the first IGS, there were a lot of governments that were there. Uh, in part, the Greek one was in Europe, and it was easy for, for many of the Europeans uh, to show up. Uh, my sense is that the reason for this, and I don't want to overstate it, but the reason was probably a couple of things. One is traditionally uh, there is a very good representation, relatively speaking, by Europe. Uh, and because of a number of proposals that were coming out of Brussels that were relevant to many of those ministers on digital economy related issues, that many of them felt they could not come. Uh, so Neely Khus, for example, who in the past has often come or sometimes come, she sent a, a, a video rather than to, to come. Uh, from an ITU perspective, not really government, but intergovernmental organization, uh, there are probably a couple reasons, but not the least of which is many went to the Korea Cybersecurity Conference, many government officials who were otherwise, so they were already out of capital for the better part of a week. The week before, given the choice, they chose that rather than the IGF. Uh, and then the third is, and this goes a little bit to the ministerial, which technically is not part of the IGF, but informs to some degree of the ability of ministers to show up. My sense is that that often depends a lot on the host government. Uh, putting the squeeze on other governments to show up, to show solidarity. I cannot speak for the Indonesian government, but the Indonesian government having just hosted the APEC Leaders Conference and having the WTO Conference uh, next month probably felt that in the realm of things that there are only a certain number of chits you can call in. That's my speculation, but uh, I wouldn't be surprised. The other reason I would list is that it did take me 34 hours to get there and 29 hours to get home. So that's, uh, not, not everybody's so good at flying as I am. Question. Scott Tazley with the research and development part of Homeland Security. Um, the color boxes, you know, the groupings of different things that were covered, do you think that's the right set going forward? Is there some shifting around in that? You know, what do you think are the main organizing areas for this sort of effort? You know, one of the topics that we've been wrestling with is the question of trust, which has you know a number of different angles and connections to it. But I just wondered whether, at the end of it, you think those are the right things to organize around, or whether there was any sense of others that ought to be brought out, or some shifting, and so forth. So the, the yellow, which is security, isn't is inclusive enough. You want? I, I don't know. I'm just yeah. at, at, yeah. at the end of it. Are those you know are those going to sustain, or do you see some shifting in terms of? what people see as the right way to structure the work? Great question. You answer. I don't know if it's an answer, but it's a comment. I've always found it a little frustrating uh, because I think a lot of it is it goes towards uh, taking care of groups ahead of time. And so, you, you know, they make sure that certain constituencies have events that are on the calendar, regardless of what the actual topic should be. And the other challenge, which actually goes to your point about Twitter, which is great, I'm still mad about what I missed in, in uh, Brazil because I thought I was in the right forum and then turned up the fight broke out in another room and you know, I missed it. <laughs> I thought I was in the right room. Um, so that gets to be a little challenging. But and then you have the, the tracks and you're like, you want to be in five rooms. And so that's that's part of it. So I think, I don't know if we mature out of that a little bit or if the constituency element of IGF continues to be part of the challenge. And then just going back to the previous question about the government, I think I've seen it on both sides. I think the Kenya meeting, where you had a very robust ministerial beforehand, brought a lot of um, Africans that may not have attended, and they stayed. And it was a very healthy dialogue throughout the whole week. And that was showing government showing and that being a very good thing. I think the fact that we had less government, and there was the Brazil 
some you know, room for a lot of it, just showed that it was still a very healthy dialogue that was not necessarily government driven. And I also, to, to an earlier point, you said that there's the legitimacy of IGF, I don't think is a question anymore. Mike, just one quick uh, comment. So, Mike has mentioned several times the recordings that are, are, are available. I'm not sure about the recordings, but the transcripts are available for most of the sessions, and the transcripts are pretty good. It's a company that we use uh, as well, so they're pretty accurate, and they usually go back and make corrections and things like that. So for those meetings where you know there were uh, overlapping sessions, I would encourage everybody to go back and, and actually just download the transcripts, and, and you'll have that to, to read. And that takes a lot less time. Tim. And, uh, if you want to be in five rooms at a time, you can do that, but only if you're remotely participating. <laughs> and it works a treat. You can have multiple transcripts open and different videos and audio streams going, and you can flip back and forth. And, and it's the way I prefer to do it. Yeah. You can do that at 2.30 in the morning? Tim has strong coffee. Yeah. <laughs> it, it is the only way to do it. It's the only way to do an ICANN meeting. It's the only way to do an IGF, because you just can't, cannot physically be in multiple places but you can be in multiple places virtually. Some of us have been real strong advocates for doing more virtually, just forgetting about the in-person in, in meeting, just doing more short, small group sessions remotely. And I'd love to see more experimentation like that. I don't think the UN is the place to do it. But. That's a great idea in, pra in principle, but I think in practice, one of the things that was really strong about this particular IGF was the, the, the amount of hall traffic there was. The I mean, I had a chance to sit down and talk with Fadi for 20 minutes, right? And I just literally got those people the, who don't know who Fadi is. Fadi, the head of IGF. And I had a chance to do that because he was passing by in the hall, and the, and the, and the venue was conducive. Um, I talked with a number of people from places like Africa, and one of the challenges was getting your ministry to pay for you to go to Bali. Come on. I mean, seriously, I think, I think that there is a lesson learned, which is as much as it's nice to go to Bali, it might be better to hold it in a place that has a little bit easier access and a lot less expensive. It was so crushingly expensive. I mean, it depressed the uh, civil society turnout, for sure, and it definitely depressed the uh, turnout. I talked to a, a couple of guys from Nairobi who got all the way to Jakarta and then were told that, that they couldn't get their visas there as had been promised and had to go back to Nairobi and came back again. And uh, I find that kind of hard to imagine mathematically, but they did it, and they were still alive. So, but, I mean, it really, it's a, really, it's a far place to go, and it, it did flush out an awful lot of people who didn't have good financial gap from there. So that's one one issue. Um, I think to your question about the way that these are organized, these are so loose, I'm not even sure that they're hugely meaningful, to be totally honest. Uh, it might be it might it might be appropriate have, having used these same categories for a while to revisit them. Uh, but I don't, I, I don't. I haven't really heard anybody come forward with a, a better setup. Some of these are definitely tried. They're, they're definitely oriented to try to provoke a certain kind of debate, uh, and a lot of them are aimed at trying to find the, some of the categories that I find in the NGO community itself. But I'm not. I, I don't think that they're that they're necessarily hugely helpful. They are very, very, very big buckets. Yes. Okay. So we have about ten minutes left, and I'd like to challenge the group here. We we have a lot of people in the internet community and in internet society that are involved in helping prepare the IGF. Um, a lot of us will be involved in Brazil. Are there things that we need to put on the agenda? Are there issues that we should push forward? Are there things that really should get people thinking differently? So I, I challenge us all to think about how we want to do things in this coming year. So now? Yeah. Just real quick on two points. I wanted to highlight again, yeah, access is a driver, I, uh, content is a driver of access. I've worked on that several of my workshops, so combining both building up broadband to those of you most and, and focusing with the content companies, uh, others on the importance of locally created um, uh, and disseminated content, it is definitely a driver. One thing though that I just wanted to mention very briefly that, that I came away with and still is as old as I am is around a lot a few times it's really you know clung on to me. I several times I wanted this guy from AT&T India to, to come and be a part of my workshop and various problems have come in uh, that where he has so I finally met him Virat and, and uh, uh, in addition to being the AT&T guy he's very much a diplomat in nature but he said something in the workshop that still for me anyway resonates he said look 
you know, because he's very much a part of the India ICTs and both, you know, so much more so than just a corporate guy. Is right. what I'm trying to ex express here. And he said, look, for the government of India, when you look at the structure, there's no way they're going to build enough schools, enough medical clinics, enough libraries. There's just it simply so they have a choice. They either look at a lost generation, another lost generation, or they use this technology. They do this convergence of often issues, but I mean it's a different sense of it in the developing countries to provide these services out there. Because again, it, there's just no other way. They're, not, they're absolutely not going to be able to build the schools and the health clinics and look like it's just not possible. It's not going to happen. Same thing in India, or I just get in, that, in, in much of Africa, where you've got an extraordinarily young population. Either either sit back and say we've lost that and try to do, you know, or you say let's. This is there, there really isn't any other way when you when you step back a moment, look at it, you know, in the, in the macro sense for these countries. That's the choice. And thank God though that this technology is in place where they can provide that. So I'm not sure. Now this one of the things that I'm hoping we can do going forward is just do a much more effective job of talking how, about how these new technologies in particular, whether it's cloud or broadband wireless or TV white spaces or some of the new interfaces that allow deaf people to communicate as well as people with, with, uh, with hearing. I mean, there's, there's a lot of opportunity here that we're not necessarily explaining as well as we could. We, we have great stories about niche applications. And what does it mean if we don't? Yeah, in other words, exactly. In other words, what's, what's, the what's, what's, the, what, what's lost? What's, what's the know? human cost? Yeah. Okay, so, so are there ideas on what we can push forward? What, what ideas we might want to get onto the agenda for the coming, coming years? For the coming year? Not just for IGF, but for the Brazil meeting, for the other discussions? I, I, sorry, I, I stepped out for a moment and I don't know, Gavin, if this is what you were talking about, but uh, I was, a lot of the work that I do these days is focused on accessibility and universal design. Uh, for persons who are blind and visually impaired, deaf and hard of hearing, and mobility impaired. And I was encouraged by some of the sessions, one of the sessions you were at, Mike, uh, on the uh, human rights uh, internet principles charter or something like that, where there was a, a sizable chunk that focused on accessibility. And we, my team, you know, we sort of looked at all the places on the agenda where accessibility was being discussed. But I think that that's something that could uh, certainly be elevated in terms of its uh, priority on the agenda, so that's certainly something we, we will work towards. Uh, other thoughts on things we might want to do different? Okay. I guess I think that I'd like to see less silage in talks of, of multi-stakeholders. I'd rather see much more multi-equal stakeholders in <laughs> the technical community and the ITF and the RIRs. We don't have representation there. We don't have the notion of stakeholder groups. And you know, we, we got that from WISIS, um, and it's carried over into the IGF, sort of naturally, because the one was born from the other. Um, but if we carry this forward into, you know, what we call multi-stakeholder processes, is uh, Brazil Dialogue, uh, Unsummit. If there are going to be three people from each country, each one representing a stakeholder group, well, there's a lot of viewpoints will be left out. And especially in the IGF, I think we focus far too much on stakeholder groups. And Derek said, oh, civil society is going to be in there. You know, I, I'm part of civil society. I'm part of the technical community. I think interested people have to be there. It doesn't matter who they are, where they're from. I, I, I made a point in one of the panels that I'm sort of multi-stakeholder man. Yeah, yeah, I teach at Georgetown, so I'm an academic. I work for Microsoft. I'm involved in the Internet Society. I've got a long history of working in government. And I think we need more people who do cross the boundaries. But what happens when you say, OK, all of you in academia, you go over here, and all of you in civil society, you go over there, and business will be over here is you get the specialists, the people who are 100% devoted to that particular cause. Much better to have a mix, have the people like yourself and myself who have lived in the different worlds and can actually be a bridge. So that's one, that's one dream I have. Okay. Yeah? I have a really long name. My name is Imani. I work for the FCC. I'm an attorney with the International Bureau. 
Um, I hear about multi-stakeholder all the time, but what about a multi-sectoral approach? I come to the Africa region, and we can talk about all this technology, but if there's not reliable sources of energy to power them, then the discussion is for naught, unless you bring people in from these various sectors to talk about the challenges. Thanks for bringing that up. Uh, there was some discussion that that term was used a few times, multi-sectoral. Their focus wasn't necessarily on the different infrastructures. Their focus was more on getting the different sectors that rely on the internet to get engaged. So there'd be more voices from the user community, whether it's individuals or banks or farmers. I think that's that's a great point, and it's we probably need a shorter word. Um, that by the third day of the meeting, yeah. there was a tweet that I, I, I think may have been the most viral tweet of the entire conference. And it was something along the lines of multi-stakeholder, multi-stakeholder, multi-stakeholderism. Multi if I hear it again, I'm going to kill myself. <laughs> it was tweeted at least 25 times. Okay, well, we've got about five minutes left, so I'm going to turn back to our discussion leaders, our lead-off hitters, who are also going to be our... I'm uh, going to take one last thing and give us a few more thoughts on what they've heard here and, and what we might want to do going forward. And I, I uh, will uh, then close out the session and invite you to stay and talk to uh, anybody and everybody because this is all about networking. So, uh, Jean? Wow, I think we've covered it all. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Solved all the uh, questions. Uh, um, I would just say it would be interesting to, I have not been involved in the, in the U.S. IGF piece of this puzzle, and so I'm curious about it. But my sense is it doesn't attract the same civil society participation that we see in Latin America, for example, and possibly even in Africa now. Um, so I think it's a, just a question to raise as to how to make this a bigger tent, broader community, make it valuable to a, a broader group. Um, uh, maybe I'm missing something, but that seems to me to be uh, my gap. Let me pick up on something that Jean said earlier, uh, which I think is, uh, is uh, important and, and particularly thoughtful, which is I think one of the things that is worthwhile for everyone to do, and I put myself in this category, of course, is, uh, particularly for next year's excitement, is, is to step back. Uh, you know, we've learned a lot. We always are learning a lot, either at IGF or the other international meetings and conversations that we're having. Uh, and one of the things that's important, I think, is to step back and examine your talking points. What is it you're saying and why are you saying it? Uh, it's very, very easy to just continue to take the position that you have traditionally taken. Uh, and one thing at the risk of stating the obvious uh, is that everything we're talking about is changing rapidly. Um, and because those things change rapidly, it is worthwhile to think through carefully what is the position, why are we taking it, and where does it lead us? Uh, that's not at all to be confused with, with abandoning, I'm not at all suggesting abandoning core principles. There are, by definition, certain core principles that, are, that don't change with time and don't change with changing circumstances. But much of what we are talking about does change. And I think this is a particularly good time. We've got a couple of you know, weeks, months to think, to step back, to work with government, to work with all the other parts, to be thinking about what is it we're trying to accomplish, what is our rhetoric associated with these things, and where are we trying to, uh, and how are we trying to get there. Um, and I think this is a particularly good time to be doing that. I think that's a great point to close on. You know, the Internet Society has its principles and its goals, and we've kept those for more than 10 years. We want the ability to share, we want the ability to connect, we want the ability to compete, the ability to innovate, the uh, ability to trust. I'm hoping that by next year we will get two or three layers more detailed, that we can have specific projects we're pushing, that we can actually turn some of those goals into things that we can rally different groups around. We don't want the idea to say, this is what we're all going to do together. But if we can get lots of groups from civil society, academia, industry, coming together to do specific things, do more experiments, I think we'll be able to move even faster. Uh, I do want to encourage everyone who's not already involved in the DC chapter of the Internet Society to get involved. It is free. 
you're a corporate person, you can also sponsor events like we're doing here at Microsoft. But it's a great organization. Um, getting engaged will help you find out what's going on elsewhere in Washington and other organizations. Uh, we have great happy hours. And uh, we do have a global network of other chapters that we plug into. Sometimes we've beamed in uh, people from Armenia, from, um, from Africa to be part of our sessions, which is a, a, a really powerful thing to do if you want to understand the global internet. So David Buerst over here is the magic man who brings all of this together. Uh, he's part of our leadership council. Uh, he's also the one who got our team organized to webcast this to the world. And I thank all of you in webcast land for being part of this. So uh, again, enjoy the muffins, the coffee, the conversation, and I want to thank all of you who participated in the discussion and all of you who came.